sharing the text today. Recognize 
numbers. Then we probably had some sort of object, and if we saw the number two, we were supposed to take two objects so that we were matching the, the quantity with the, the digit, with the numeral. Then uh, we had to, uh, we followed that by learning to add and then subtract. Remember what came next? Multiply and then divide. And of course, if, if you went on to a higher level math courses, we had to have Algebra 2, but only after you had taken Algebra 1. So it's a step by step. It was learning. And more or less the same pattern followed uh, in learning how to read. We had to recognize the individual letters first, and then we had to learn the sound that the letter makes, and then we had to learn when you put two or three letters together, sometimes there's one sound that is made. Then we learned sight words. Anybody remember the first sight word you ever learned? <laughs> Mine was is. I don't know why I remember that. Uh, so and and then after sign word, after the sight words, we got to read more complete sentences. So I think that we can agree that our learning in life, for many things, comes in stages. You know, a carpenter learns in stages. Think of what he or she needs, basically, and then they build on the basics. A chef learns in stages. A mechanic learns in stages. A seamstress learns in stages. And I can't imagine, I just don't think that our method of gaining knowledge um, or insights into subject areas comes any differently today than it did for the first group of men and women who followed and learned from Jesus. I think that they, like us, learned important things and lessons in life in what I call today bits and pieces, or they learned in fits and starts. Do you remember that phrase? to learn something in fits and starts. You know, that means that you, you, you learn a little bit, you take a break, you learn a little bit more, take another break, fits and starts. It's kind of like how I learned algebra. Only I never got the restart sometimes. But certainly, the disciples in the first century, they, they didn't learn all that there was to learn in just those three short years, did they? I think that they learned in bits and pieces. And then over a lifetime, they might say they had learned some lessons. And so I take delight in the scriptures, and I take delight when today, like today, two passages of scripture help confirm for me that this just may have been the case, that they did learn in bits and pieces, in fits and starts. That learning came a little bit at a time with experience, and then some growth, and then some putting it all together. As a disciple learned something new, he or she discovered it was possible, it was possible to change. So the more that they learned, the more apt they were to change, to become more of the person that God created them to be, to become more of the disciple that Jesus wanted them to be. And they found that there was a change in, in his or her way of, of doing and a way of thinking. And so we're going to talk about Peter today, because that is what happened with Peter at first. Notice the gospel text backtracked on us. We're in the Easter season. We're expecting to hear post-resurrection stories, sightings of Jesus after the resurrection, and the gospel lesson takes us back to a scene in the upper room before the death of Christ. 
How many times have we heard that story? How many times have we heard that story of, of Jesus gathering his disciples in the upper room because he knew the end was imminent? And so as we look at that text today, and as we think about the upper room, Peter was among them because Peter was one of those disciples that Jesus had come. And in that opening verse that Lisa read, when he had gone out, well, the he was Judas. So the setting for today's gospel is at that moment in the upper room where Judas had betrayed Jesus. Jesus recognized the betrayal, and Judas left. And so once the betrayer had been identified and left, Jesus then spoke the words that we heard as Lisa continued reading that gospel text. So he was talking to the 11 remaining disciples in the upper room, and he knew that his time was running out. He knew that his time was getting short. But he had one more piece of learning for them. He needed to teach them a new commandment. And the new commandment, to love one another. That was a new teaching, or Jesus framed it in a new way. The disciples heard it, and I have to wonder what it was like then for the disciples to learn in bits and pieces the depth and the breadth and what that truly meant. What did that commandment truly mean? It's one thing to hear it, but then how did they learn to put it to use? I just can't imagine that they were able to understand in that moment all of the encompassing pieces to what it means to love one another. So I think that is one of the lessons that came to the disciples in bits and pieces. And I wonder how long it really took them to discover how deeply, what depth there is to that commandment. So let's leave the scene in the upper room. Fast forward just a few years, short time, to the Acts passage. So Jesus has died. He has made his appearances after death to his disciples. He had that meeting with Peter on the shore and said to Peter, do you love me? And that, you know, that exchange three times. Peter was sort of reinstated in relationship. Peter affirmed, yes, Lord, I love you. We know that the ascension has happened, and we know that Pentecost has happened because it was in that reading. It was in that reading where Peter said, you know, the Holy Spirit fell upon us. And so if the ascension has happened, Pentecost has happened, and the disciples are now at work spreading the good news because they had been filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of the setting for that act passage. And the focus for this message and for that passage is on Peter. We've been talking about Paul on Peter today. Now, Peter had that vision that Lisa read about from chapter 11, but the whole story begins back in chapter 10. So if you want to go back home later and read chapter 10 and then read chapter 11, you're going to see the same story. It appears twice, because in chapter 10, we know what happens. In chapter 11, it's the retelling of the story. So, there was this vision that Peter had, not a dream, but a vision. And there was a voice that accompanied that vision, and the voice said to Peter, Get up, kill, eat. And Peter said, no, I don't think so. You see, the creatures in that vision 
were not the kinds of animals a faithful Jew would get up and kill and then eat. It had been so much a part of Peter's life to know the boundaries around what was allowed and what was not allowed in his Jewish faith. He was a faithful Jew. And so he knew that there were some boundaries. Some of those were around what to eat, what not to eat. What's clean and what's not clean. And to be suddenly told that he could change. That he could change. Well, it appears that it took God three times to tell Peter. Peter got hung up on the number three, you know. But he had to, he had to stir Peter three times to get Peter to understand on the meaning of the vision, to understand here a bit more about what's going to be the commandment to love one another. This is a bit of the learning to love one another. So I want to talk about boundaries for a moment. Okay, like Peter, we each have our boundaries. One of my children and her family have a pet, a Labrador, I think it's a chocolate lab. His name is Brock. Now even to a cat lover like me, Brock is a sweet dog. Big, but sweet. But dogs with, and, and breeds like Brock, you know, they, they have a nature and it's a nature to run and they like to run. And now the family does have a pretty big backyard, so that affords Brock a place where, where he can run. Um, but they're responsible landowners and responsible neighbors, so they decided they were going to put up one of these invisible fences for Brock. You know what those are like? You know, Brock doesn't need to be tied up. He doesn't need to be on a leash. He doesn't need to be on a lead. He wears a certain collar around his neck. And if he goes to a certain point in the perimeter of that yard, he gets a little zap. You know, it gives him just a little electric shock. And it reminds him he's not supposed to go beyond the boundary. And yet, even in the world of dogs, Learning comes in bits and pieces. And for Brock, he has learned that if he can run or bolt before the collar gets put on, then he can expand the boundaries of his invisible fence. No collar, no shock. He likes it. And I don't blame him. He was born to run. Well, you know, sometimes I think we humans get to act like that, too. Especially when it comes to following God and following the nudges of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, sometimes it's time to forego the collar. Sometimes it's time to forego the collar that holds us back. It limits our area in which to do ministry. It was time for Peter to expand the perimeter of his thinking about who God meant to be included in the hearing of the good news. It was time for Peter to expand his understanding of what it means to love one another as Jesus had instructed and not be constrained. The vision Peter had was perhaps less about the proper foods to eat and more about who needs to hear the good news. And Peter followed the nudge of the Spirit. He followed the nudge of that vision. He followed the nudge of that voice. And he took the message of redemption into the homes of Gentiles. He was expanding his boundary. 
So just when Peter perhaps thought he had all that he needed in learning, something shifted in Peter's thinking through the vision, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and Peter's own receptivity to it, because we do have to be receptive to the nudges of the Holy Spirit. Transformation was happening once again for Peter. And what a blessing it would become for this young church. The church is just getting started in the book of Acts. And for this young church to learn that to love one another meant to share the good news with everyone and not to exclude. Exclude no one from hearing about God's love. And I think that this is important. I think it's an important note that what we have here in Acts chapter 11, as I said earlier, is Peter's retelling of the story of the vision. So like I said, if you take your Bibles, you will see it recorded first in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, he tells his story. And he tells it to the Gentiles. And we learn that the Gentiles would change when they heard Peter's account. And that everyone then is primed to learn even more. Still, they may all learn in bits and pieces, in fits and starts, but the message is spread. For me, the beauty in this account in, Peter is, in Peter's discipleship, in his growth, is that this was a believer telling his own story. Peter didn't take his new learning and what it means to love one another to some level of a theological argument. He told a story about himself and what God had revealed to him. Arguments, theological or otherwise, don't change lives, you know. At least that hasn't been my experience in life. A person's personal story, in his or her own words, about his or her own life, that's what makes a difference. That's what makes a difference in being able to better understand how to love one another. For me, arguments create winners and losers. And somebody gets left out. And I don't think that's the place that God wants us to be. I think God wants us to be in a place of understanding how to love one another. Hearing a person's personal story, it can just widen our boundaries. It just causes something to deepen within ourselves. And I think it happens on most any subject. And I think it happens when we put ourselves in a place of being willing to listen to another person's story. Now, I know there are reasons why people choose not to tell their personal faith stories to others. I know that. And I can list a few of those reasons. Person doesn't think his or her story is important. We don't think our stories are exciting enough. We think that because our story isn't as dramatic as the change of Saul on the road to Damascus, it's not worth telling. Nobody's going to believe us if we tell them it was like the one that Saul had. We might be afraid to tell our story because it's going to look like maybe we are trying to manipulate someone to believe like we do. If we share our story, it may be that we make ourselves look self-righteous. Those are excuses. Or we feel we don't have adequate words. So we keep our stories. 
and we keep our stories close, especially the stories about how God has acted in our lives. We keep them to ourselves. Or we only give that super condensed, clipped version, I grew up in the church. That one sentence becomes the beginning, the middle, and the end of our story. But stories hold the key to changing lives. Stories hold the key to changing lives. And Peter's story was intended to change lives. It was and is a story which, in my words, says, look, I heard what Jesus said about loving one another. And through my vision, I have learned a bit more about what Jesus meant by that. And I'm going to tell my story. I'm not going to argue the points. I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to show others that God's love is so deep and so broad and so beautiful. And I'm going to tell that story because my boundary is free. I don't have to be constrained. I can tell my story. I had one person come to me this week to share their story. I learned from it, and I am grateful. So please keep telling your own story to yourself until you're ready to share it. And remember that I'm a willing listener. Stories do change lives. We're seeing it in scripture through Paul's story. And now we're seeing it with Peter's story. And remember, learning in bits and pieces and in fits and starts is a very human way to learn. It's the way we learn. It's the way God designed us to learn. And equally so, we learn best, not through arguments about faith, this or that or what black and white is, but by listening to one another's stories.